So welcome to the second episode of the history of Western philosophy, the Greek early Greek philosophies part two. So what we're going to be covering here are influential philosophers that came before the time of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the people you know. You probably might have never heard of those people again, but they had did have a huge influence on early Greek philosophy and the Western philosophy in general, so we're going to be covering them. So the first philosopher we're going to be covering today is Anaxagoras. So he was an Ionian. Again, he was born in the country of Ionia in the peninsula of the Greek city-state. But again, this doesn't necessarily have to mean that he was from the Ionian school, but in this case, he actually was. This person was a person that followed the Ionian school tradition. Remember the Ionian school that we covered in the very first beginning of the first episode? So he was a member of that school. He continued on the traditions of that school. So he's not really that big. Like if you go up to a philosopher and say Anaxagoras, there's a 50-50 chance that you might know him or he might not know him. What Anaxagoras is famous for is his theory of his mind. He said that everything was made out of the mind. Now, David Hume covers this later in his philosophy, but this was revolutionary for him because, again, everything could be explained by saying it's a logical concept of a biological being that's made by the mind. Socrates, when he first read Anaxagoras, claimed that it was a pretty good idea, that everything was made out of the mind, that everything could be explained by the mind. So the problem with Anaxagoras is the exact same thing. While he says that the mind composes everything, he doesn't really go into details of what laws or what things that make up the mind. Sure, everything's based on a perception or a senses. This entire thing could be hallucinations, or in any case, or a little simpler, this entire world is our perception of senses, so it has to be part of the mind. But the thing is, he doesn't actually go anywhere with it. He just says that it's the mind and he doesn't want to work anywhere. So that's the problem with Anaxagoras. But he was famous, not at least. Next philosopher is Empedocles. This philosopher was an interesting philosopher nonetheless. Pythagoras was the first person who was a, both a mathematician and a philosopher. Empedocles is a little different case. He combined science and philosophy, and he tried to make a little combination of his own, which, again, have succeeded down to later generations. So for his sciences, he discovered a lot. He said that he discovered the concept of the air, you know, oxygen molecules and carbon dioxide, all those things that make up the air. He argued that there can't be nothing there. Everything has to be filled with something. He also said that plants have male and female counterparts. Of course, this isn't exactly true, but it was pretty close given that there weren't any scientific instruments in the list. He had advancements in astronomy and found out that the moon reflects light from the sun and then there's stars that are far away. He also worked on medicine and he discovered a lot of those. Now, for his religion, this is interesting, he said that everything in this world, there could be two major counterparts, love and strife. Those are opposites, right? Love means that you give altruistic mind, you care about people while strife is hating, fighting, etc. He said that the world could be divided into those two things. Now, what's going to happen is that love and strife are going to keep fighting each other. And one day, love or strife is going to take the entire universe. But then what's going to happen is that there will be imbalances. So the opposite, if strife, strife was the one that took over, love is going to retake over. He doesn't really explain the process why, So, but he says that. He says that it's going to go over and it's going to be the opposite side. So now love would be the major thing in the entire universe. But again, he says that this cycle will continue without really saying why. And this science of his, his reasoning and his religion blends into his philosophy, which is of a god and a sinner. Now what this means is that he got love and strife, right? He didn't know why it existed, but he said there was a conflict of undeniable good and undeniable evil that existed. So he sometimes perceived himself as a philosopher who describes all this. So there's this rational thing and this religion of love. It's the God. I'm God. I'm looking at everything. He takes a very pride. He take a very big pride in his views and his works and it's shown in lots of his works. But sometimes he does the opposite. He says that he's a sinner, that he's repenting for sins by doing philosophy. Again, he doesn't really explain why. This is probably just imbalances between knowing everything and knowing that you're nothing. So Empedocles presents a very interesting problem. Now, the philosophers that are very, very, very well mentioned in science textbooks are the atomists. Atomists, of course, are people who first discovered the concept of the atom. The most well-known one is Democritus, but there's one more. His name is Lepircus. So Lepircus was more in 440 BC when Democritus was slightly later in 420 BC. They both stated that atoms were indivisible. Of course, you can divide them physically, but atoms themselves were indivisible, indestructible. 
they can't be destroyed and that there's spaces between two and they're also in constant motion. These people, Le Le Luci Lucipus and Democritus, are people that can't really be separated. When something is attributed to one, the same is attributed to another. Of course, Democritus is more known, but that's because he flourished later on. So, for them, they can't be really considered real philosophers. Of course, before Socrates' time, the philosophy was that of nature philosophy, finding out what, what the world was all about and what rules and concepts made of the world. But see, people didn't really take a scientific view. Even Thales, who's considered the most scientific of the Ionian schools, simply stated that water was everything and goes into a slightly metaphysical explanation. But for them, it was more of a scientific inquiry. Their questions were not of, when you ask the question why things exist, or why does this happen, there's two possible questions you could be asking. One is, why is this specific thing happening right now? which is the existence of metaphysics that goes on into the boundaries of ideals that we can't reach. But there's another one of why this thing, this thing happened, what caused it? And for the Atomists, Le Civicus and Democritus, the second question was the one that's presented for them. Now, one problem they had was with the question of the void. They argued that there were some spaces in the world that was not made out of anything. However, in this case, it will be impossible to have those kind of things. Motion has to rise from somewhere, right? But if there's a thing when there's no motion, when there's no movements of anything at all, this would be impossible to generate or even stay still since atoms would have to bound it. One thing you have to remember is that these people, even though they're renowned for finding out the first atoms, don't really mean anything. There are a lot of people who had lots of theories about this world, and this is just one of those theories. They just got lucky then, after all. They are good thinkers, they came up with the concept of the atom, but you can't really credit them for discovering the atom in the first place. So the last person we are going to cover is Protagoras. He was a sophist. Now, we didn't cover sophists mainly because I want to cover it later on, and this is where I'm going to cover it. Sophists were people who gave out lessons and teachings to the other people in Greece and received money for them. Their original name comes from the Greek word professor, and they, unfortunately, were criticized by others. Socrates and other people of his little group said that you can't charge people for wisdom, that knowledge was priceless. And the problem with this was that these ideas were mostly of the poor and the philosophers. So to the selfish, knowledge, philosophy, this was just a way of making money. Right now, you can't really criticize philosophy professors because they make money off books or their lectures or whatnot. And that's the view that they took. There's heavy criticism for the selfish, mostly because the only writings that survive are of Plato and Aristotle. So you have to remember that sophists aren't really that bad. Sophists weren't were very good arguers. They, they were professional lawyers, you could say, although lawyers didn't exist, exist back then and you have to testify by yourself. They taught people how to speak and they were willing to keep up with the arguments even if it led to absurd conclusions, which is usually that nothing could be proven to exist. Protagoras in general was a teacher in Athens that he talked with Socrates and some other philosophers of those era. His main philosophy was that man was, should be the measure of everything. All we can think of is man, right? How can we compare things to other people? And he said that man what should be the measure of the entire universe and all things considered. So sophists did have a bad view, but they're not the point. So in the next episode, we'll be going on to the Socratic philosophers. Socrates, of course, Plato and Aristotle. So yeah, that's it for those episodes episode of early Greek philosophy, remember that these philosophers were very influential people. They might not be well known, their teachings might be a little awkward, it might not really fit in with the logic of today, but remember that they are really well and famous people and that they have lasted out through the ages, their teachings have flowed out and other people have criticized it because they were so good.